One of the first people I met as a boy soldier when I joined the army at 15 was the Royal Army, in the Royal Army Medical Corps, was a Lance Corporal Phil Carras, who was the uh, physical training instructor in the Kiowa Barracks Holder Shop. And uh, I met him a couple of days before I, was, I purchased my discharge from the SAS. And uh, I said, oh, Phil, nice to see you. I says, have you joined the regiment? He says, yeah, I've just passed. I says, oh, well, I would advise you not not to pass and go back to your unit. This lot will get you killed. And uh, unfortunately, you did die in a Falklands war. So uh, you can only give advice to people. So I'm advising people not to join the British Army because, I mean, say, I don't think things have changed. British Army soldiers uh, need a union. We need somebody to protect us from officers, politicians, and the class system. But anyway, once you join the SAS regiment, yeah, you, you're sent away and you do, first of all, the uh, jungle training, which is uh, survival in the jungle, living off the land, uh, learning how to get water from vines, uh, walking down a track and you see ants crossing the track. Uh, if you stand on them, it takes them about four or five minutes to regroup and go across the track again in the line. So looking at the ants on a track, you can tell if people are in front of you. Simple as that. So simple, what they eat in the jungle and things. And a, a guy called Lofty Wiseman was the chief instructor for the jungle training. Uh, so you do the jungle training, you come back to Hereford, which I did, and you do demolitions, which was interesting how to make uh, ring mains, how to use uh, detonators, which uh, was a like a copper tube filled with a, a glass with acid in it. And you broke the tube and you got like a 15 minute delay fuse and things like that, really good stuff. And uh, lots of formula, how to break, uh, blow up things and uh, oil pipes. And so you, you didn't use too much uh, C4, doing the mission uh, but there's there's one form I always remember P for plenty if you use plas plastic explosive if you put it on a lot it does the job you know but there's a technical formula for everything that you blow up we did made clear mine mines improvised explosive devices how to make uh, uh, you know explosives from uh, things you find in houses and things a lot, a lot of interesting stuff uh, Morse code and signals was a, the next thing we learned everybody had to be very good at Morse code so uh, we all became Morse code operators uh, a funny thing about Morse code that a lot of people don't know is it is a fingerprint exactly every every Morse code operator has a slightly different technique and uh, what, what used to hap happen was for instance Russians would come to Hereford and listen to Morse code and tape it and then they'd find out who was the in the SES by listening to our Morse code and we do the same to the Russians uh, there was a Cold War agreement that six cars could go behind Russian lines and six Russian cars could go behind NATO lines to stop the build-up of troops uh, and start the start of a Cold War. But these cars were sophisticated things and they, they could pick up Morse code. So you'd go to a nearer barracks, you'd see the flag flying, an artillery unit or a parachute regiment and uh, listen to their Morse code. So again, we identified their operators and their units by Morse code. Uh, other things that happened was uh, in, uh, especially in the British Army, most corps and regiments have magazines. The Russian embassy used to subscribe to a copy of all the magazines because it gives them information on many soldiers, officers, and what the units were doing, 
and new weapons being introduced into the units. Really absurd that these magazines were so easily available. But the Russians aren't stupid, I tell you. They even sent uh, officers to Sandhurst. Yeah. And we say, we allow so many different countries to send officers to, to Sandhurst. It was easy for Russian spies to get into these uh, countries and go to Sandhurst to become British trained officers. So they'd learn all the te technical and tactics of the British Army from section attacks, uh, platoon attacks, company attacks, battalion attacks, and the, all the different weapons and methods of uh, attacking Russian forces. Uh, stupidity, really, how simple things are. But this was the SES uh, finding information on the enemy, and uh, the Russians would find information on us. Our training was interrupted because we had to go to the Oman, which was a secret war, which involved uh, may only SES and a few attached personnel and uh, a contingent of the RAF regiment to guard the, the base at Silala. So we, uh, a lorry had gone over a mine and quite a few SES had been injured from B Squadron SES and uh, we were got sent out to replace them with uh, some wounded SES that were returning to the unit. We flew into uh, Cyprus and uh, there was a party going on, it, I think it was RAF Akrotary in Cyprus. So we get crashed the party, got a few beers and there was only one table with seats available so we went and sat there. It turned out it was the wing commander who was leaving and retiring. So one of these troopers I was with said, you must have been in charge a couple of months ago when uh, we had a wounded SES trooper who needed an emergency evacuation. We sent him to uh, Sharjah to be airlifted to Cyprus and he put him on an old aeroplane that couldn't fly above the turbulence. There was a VC-10 there and you didn't throw off the officers because you didn't want to like uh, inconvenience the officers. That trooper died on the way due to the turbulence with uh, his wounds opened up and he bled to death before he got to Cyprus. You are a fucking murderer. And he said this to this wing commander. And besides that, he was getting aggressive. I could see he was going to chin this wing commander, so I tried to be diplomatic and say, let's go now. <laughs> the wing commander says, how did you know that? So he admitted that it was a fact. And he says, uh, the trooper says, on, on charge, we had a, a team that did relay from the old man uh, to Cyprus and all the way back to the UK, to Hereford, with our Morse operators, and they informed us about the, the pilot, the air, aircraft available, and what you did. At this, he started to cry. The wing commander was crying. So anyway, we left there, and I think we next day they got were out of uh, Cyprus and were landed in Sharjah and had to wait a couple of days there. I uh, there's not a lot to do in Sharjah, so we went round the coastline for a walk. Me and a lad called Brummy O'Hare, who passed the SA course with me and uh, he was a very good swimmer and he taught me a bit how to swim better than I could before which was very good but he was to be a victim soon he, his Land Rover would go over a mine in the near future and uh, blew his foot to the let me say virtually lost his foot and had to be um, kicked out of the SAS and the army uh, when we were walking around the coastline, there was a, a statue there, and I, I read the statue, and it said uh, it was a, I can't remember the name of the ship, SS something or other, it ran aground in 1908 or something like that, and the, the crew had been cannibalized by the local Arabs. I'm looking at it, 
I'm looking around us is uh, come on Bromi we'll go back <laughs> uh, interesting thing so we went back to Shah into the, the camp and then the flows to the old man we arrived in Salala and we got a briefing from the uh, commanding officer of uh, B squadron SCS who allocated this to different troops uh, I went to a uh, boat troop which was Bravo 2-0 that was the code for a boat troop uh, my mate Waddy Graham went to uh, free fall troop and uh, we're, we're both quite happy about our allocation but uh, we, we got flown up into the Jebel by helicopter to uh, join the whole squadron and this officer had uh, said we were going on a, uh, a mission to uh, find and destroy the enemy on this uh, mountain range and uh, well, we were told in the beginning that uh, it was a British Army training team and that we'd be split into four, four groups of four and train the Arabs and the tribesmen into doing this type of operation. But this officer, a typical route, wanted a, a bit like Lawrence of Arabia. He wanted to make a name for himself and wipe out the enemy single-handed. Uh, he, he was going to, I'm going to say, he was going to use a squadron as a, a rifle company, ordinary infantry rifle company a parachute regiment could have done better because most uh, SAS personnel are from all different corps and regiments not really training as a, a rifle company that's not the idea of a rifle company our, our training was to work behind Russian lines in four-man teams and blow up good missiles and things like that a rifle company no so anyway he had his form up and he, he turned around to me and he says uh, you go with that officer over there who's uh, a British officer in charge of the JS unit a mortar unit so I said, yes sir three bags full sir you can't refuse orders so I ended up with this officer and we drove to Hill 880 uh, the barren hill you could see for miles and obviously an enemy could see you for miles hard to hide two mortars on a hill but anyway that's where we were told to locate and that's where we went next thing this officer we got in the we, we'd gone there by t two trucks with uh, mortars and uh, all the ammunition bumping along the road with all this ammunition not a road really dirt track and what, what you could drive on it though. incredible so uh, we we'll get there and he buggers off. So I contacted the, the commander and says, the officer's gone. The man in charge, he's, he's legged it. He didn't stay. So I couldn't speak Arabic that well and none of the Arabs could speak English. So I, I reported the situation. I said, look, I can't give you a water cover because, because of this. So he sent a guy up who was fluent in Arabic to... Uh, accompany me on the position the the troops went down the troop uh, they all split up going down this wadi in a valley and uh, it wasn't the SES attacking the enemy the enemy attacked the squadron they had a much bigger force than we had so we all had to back out in a hurry and uh, retreat to the start position and this officer returned with his two wagons and loaded the two mortar tubes on and all the ammunition and went back to the start position and we had a debrief by the officer during the debriefing you could hear a lot of shell fire mortars rockets going off somewhere and a radio report coming in hill 880 has just been obliterated by the enemy and I'm thinking fucking hell I was just on that good job I dug in I was the only one that dug in using my experience from the parachute regiment nobody else dug in 
And uh, I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? These officers are going to get us killed. And this officer in particular, he lost so many men that uh, I think he got the order to uh, go back to using it as a training team rather than uh, combat infantry. But anyway, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later on. The, the uh, photograph I've added was taken over 40 years ago when we didn't have YouTube. Uh, so it's not photoshopped. Uh, all those that call me Walter Mitty and uh, bullshitter and I don't talk like an SCS trooper. Okay. That's why I put the photographs on for people like you. <laughs> 